everybody. Welcome here to the Wine with Jimmy channel. I'm Jimmy Smith and we're here on a series about the Canary Islands, if you can't tell from the presentation, and my t-shirt. So welcome to another wonderful series here where you're going to learn everything you need to know about the Canary Islands. A wonderful place to get to grips with, with some very unique and exciting wines. So real great uh, presentations to go through. Let's have a look at what we're going to go through. It is quite a big one. It's a seven parter because I am very passionate about these wines. I love these collection of islands. I love the volcanicity behind them and the rather exceptional wines produced. Okay, let's get really to grips with the Canary Islands. In this presentation, it's going to be about the introduction location, the history, then we're going to go through the volcanicity, the geology of this area. So first of all, it is Spanish, but it is far from Spain. And the map shows you this. It's in the Atlantic Ocean, and with some nice round numbers here, it's about a hundred clicks from Africa, but about a thousand clicks from Spain, as you can see. So much closer to the continent of Africa than it is to uh, Western Europe and to Spain. Uh, so a long way away. And of course, this makes it very different in terms of its climate, which we cover next video. What about the history that we have here? So first of all, we have the Guanches. Now, the Guanches were um, original inhabitants of these islands. Little know, is known about them, though there is some wonderful folklore around these, which I'll go through a little bit later on. Now, in 2017, the first genome-wide data from the Guanches confirmed a North African origin and that they were most genetically similar to modern North African Berber peoples. And that, of course, is logical because it's only 100 kilometers away from Africa. Um, so they're the local indigenous uh, in po uh, population. We then have possibly Phoenicians or Romans, though we have very little evidence of that. We're going to move to um, really um, a, a, a real distinctive part in the history of the Canary Islands, which is really the Spanish. So there is a treaty of the Alcasobas, which was an agreement signed by the kingdoms of Castile uh, and Portugal. So Castile really in the emergence of the Reconquista and then Portugal. Uh, and it was held in a Portuguese village of the same name, so Alcasoba, uh, in 1479. So these two powerhouses divided territory. Portugal took the Azores, they took Madeira and the Cape Verde Islands, and the Canary Islands fell to the Spanish under Spanish control by 1495. Of course, with little respect for the Guanches. And of course, there, there is then a lot of friction between the Spanish and the Guanches and all other European uh, powerhouses that follow. Um, so what about some of the first establishments here? Garachico is founded in north northwestern Tenerife by 1497 by the gentleman you see here, Cristobal de Pont. He was a Genoese financier. Sugarcane and grapevines were the order of the day at this time, but the Spanish realize that they can plant more sugarcane in the areas that they were annexing in the New World. So then sugarcane production here on these islands diminished to next to nothing. And of course, grapevines took over. So this is the real starting point of importance of winemaking in the early, uh, early 16th century in this area. Uh, so what about more here in terms of history? So the initial markets for the wines were the Americas, and that's because this was a staging point before uh, a lot of the uh, transports would leave Europe and Spain before heading out to the New World. So a lot of wine would head out to the uh, New World, but also going the other way to the European markets. Uh, and 
as the 17th century progressed, one market in particular really took a shining to the Canary Islands, and that is England, and would later then monopolize that trade. Uh, and there is etymology based in this. If you go to London, you will know that there's a place called Canary Wharf that takes its name from this really important time in trade with the Canary Islands. So yes, England falls in love with Canary wine. So what was Canary wine at this time? Well, it was a rather luxurious wine in all senses. It was very highly prized. It actually fetched twice as much as French wine, like Sauternes at that time. Now, by the end of the 17th century, this was 1691, the Canary fleet was so large that it alarmed residents of Weymouth on the south coast of England. So imagine they're going about their day to day. They always look to the sea just in case there might be some sort of threat. And suddenly they see huge amounts of ships and it looks like a Spanish armada. So, of course, they raise the alarm because they think they are being invaded by the Spanish. But it was just copious amounts of ships bringing canary wine all the way to the UK, to England. Now, um, this we know about. We have some wonderful data. We actually have some uh, proof, living proof of this. Here, um, uh, wonderful winemaker Jorge uh, and grape grower, uh, currently sort of in, in place at Vignatigo. Um, he is uh, the, the son of Juan Jesus, uh, who are exceptionally important for viticulture and winemaking across the island, specifically Tenerife and smaller islands around that. At Vignatigo, they found a number of very old barrels of Malvasia, which was the grape variety used to produce canary wine, with a written certification of its authenticity. And analysis found lots of succinic acid, which is a compound produced by very long, slow ferments of very sweet must. So this gave us the evidence that these wines were very, very sweet. So this analysis means that old canary wines were sweet and non-fortified. There is an exceptionally old wine in here as well. The Vignatigo are recreating the methods of making this sweet wine. So um, we have the, um, the capital city is still at this point being Garachico. The indigenous peoples of Tenerife, who we call the Guanches, remember, uh, they believe that their sacred mountain, Tiede, which is the largest mountain of all of Spain, including the uh, mainland, and that's what you see here on Tenerife, imprisoned the forces of evil, the devil. Uh, and the devil was called Guayota, and it was imprisoned in Tiede by their supreme god, Achaman. In 1706, as the island had been invaded and pillaged, uh, Achaman had not been worshipped for a number of years, around 200 years. So apparently Achaman gets upset and he unleashes uh, the gates of hell, which of course is the volcano of Mount Tiede. It erupts on the 5th of May of 1706, destroying Garachico, the European settlement on the north of the island, and solidifying the port under lava, turning it into stone. Most of the agricultural plantations were also destroyed, and the Europeans had to move their enterprises and moved eastwards, and they moved to Orotava. So here we go. I've got you a lovely map showing you here. There's Mount Tiede in the kind of central part of Tenerife. Garachico is up here. That, of course, gets destroyed by the 1706 eruption. And the Europeans move, first of all, to Porta de la Cruz, as you see there in the middle of the north part of the island. Now, the demand for canary wine stops due to the instability of the main export market of England in the 17th century. Um, and, of course, there are competition markets like Madeira, Marsala and also Port at that time. 
Uh, around this time, winemakers needed to be able to diversify and change. So they were producing, of course, this canary wine, but suddenly that diminished. And they started to produce a wine called Vidueno, which is a blended wine. It's like a, um, a, a kind of uh, a vineyard blend, a, um, a field blend, if you will. So uh, it was a dry wine, field blended from the um, high yielding Cordon Trenzado vines. I'll go through that on part two about viticulture. It never became too successful uh, and um, Porta de la Cruz never really uh, reached the heights of Garachico. So the capital city again moved eastwards and this time to Santa Cruz, which today remains the main city of Tenerife. Uh, Vidueno, by the way, um, is being recreated by some producers, certainly spearheaded by Suetes de Marquez, who make a Vidueno, which is a multi-blended style with lots of different grape varieties. Then we have uh, um, some difficult times for the islands. Uh, in the 19th century, no phylloxera. Phylloxera doesn't like generally islands, nor does it like volcanic soils. But the mildew, so both powdery mildew and downy mildew, certainly did um, wreak havoc on the islands. Uh, so the production diminished at this point and didn't really ever get back to a sort of pre-mildew uh, year uh, production rates. Uh, most wine then throughout the 20th century certainly was produced for local consumption and of course for tourism. Uh, but we are now seeing a real distinct lift in modern days to international markets with certainly great literature like Santo Bain's book on the epic wines of the Canary Islands, plus, of course, great producers like Suertes del Marquez, for example, amongst many others that we'll discover on this series. Um, and then, of course, uh, troubled, this area was troubled by the new commercial wines of mainland Spain. Um, so they were starting to flood into the island and competing with these local wines. So several producers from the local community began to voice their opinions about this invasion from Spain and started to modernize their grape growing and winemaking techniques in order to compete. In 1985, they applied for a DO uh, and it was awarded as the first Canary Islands DO and that's Tacaronte Asantejo, as you'll see at the top part here in 1992. If you have any questions, any comments about this presentation, these videos, the Canary Islands, get in touch. Maybe you've been, where do you like to visit? What kind of bodegas have you visited? What wines do you like? What about the gastronomy? Please get in touch, comment below in the comments section. So that's our wonderful amount of history, really setting your scene. Lots of DOs then followed after that. We're now going to talk about the geology of, um, of volcanism, volcanicity and tectonic plates and how it's important to the Canary Islands. So here you'll see is a map of the world showing most of the major plates like the Eurasian plate, the African plate, the South American plate, the North American plate, and so on. Here we have a number of different types of movements of these plates. So we have things like convergent plates, which is majorly uh, plates around the Pacific Ring of Fire, for example, uh, forming big mountain ranges like the Andes and the Cascades. And then we have things like divergent uh, um, uh, 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 plates uh, and divergent um, moving plates. So we have uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which comes through here, and Iceland is in fact part of this as you go up here, as you see, uh, which is on that. So that's where they are pulling apart the divergent. Now, that's actually nothing to do, both of those, with the Canary Islands. The Canary Islands sits here away from plate activity. So what we have here is an actual thinner area of the Earth's crust causing what we call hot spots. So let's have a look at this. Here is quite a classic thing you'll see in geography class, maybe you went to at school, but you've got a lot of action here. So you've actually got um, subdu subduction volcanoes here on the right hand side. That's how we form things like the Andes and the Cascades 
uh, in, in Western America. And that's a converging margin uh, producing that one, rising magma, and you might get volcanic activity here. OK, so then you've got a divergent margin on the left hand side, like the mid Atlantic Ridge. Remember, I mentioned Iceland. They're moving away. And that, of course, causes um, uh, lots of magma to come up. Uh, and then you've got in between those areas what we call hotspots, hotspot volcanoes. Generally, this is in areas where there are quite a lot of convection currents, slightly thinner crust, and you'll get these certain volcanic activity, which is what the uh, Canary Islands is all about. So um, the, the rocks we're looking at here are igneous rocks, and all soils derived from them are based from that. So igneous rocks are formed from molten magma. I feel like I should be a part of uh, um, uh, Austin Powers when I say magma. And we have intrusive forms, which are granitic, basalt and gabbro, which are formed under the ground. And then we have extrusive, which are things like ash, lapilli and tooth, which are uh, kind of pyroclastic. They're exploded out of things like volcanoes. Now, these soils are newish soils for the most part, and they are high in fertility, but not necessarily as we know it for vines. A lot of it is not broken down enough for access for the vines. Soil structure here, very well draining, um, very low in, in organic matter as a topsoil, exceptionally low, uh, but very dark soils which have great heat conductivity and heat capacity. The soils here, we will have minerals, nutrients like nitrogen, magnesium, potassium, calcium, sulfur, uh, and significant amounts of sulfur and significant amounts of iron as well. The sulfur element is very important for reduction in these wines, which I'll go through, and then the iron for the oxidative uh, component of these wines, the savoury character that one can find in these wines. So here you are. What does this have as an effect on the wines? So first of all, uh, there is much higher dry extract. So basically, you've got less pulp and flesh and there's a lot of skin uh, ratio in comparison to that. Uh, Olivier Humbrecht of Humbrecht in Alsace did a study on the Rangen Titan Grand Cru, which is the only Grand Cru on volcanic soils in Alsace. And he found significantly more dry extract in his Rangon to Town Grand Cru than others. Um, there's a more savoury character in these wines, less fruity, and that's often being linked to the high iron content, which is a higher oxidising agent. So we tend to get more savoury notes. There is a, a distinct saltiness to these wines as well with actual magnesium salts, potassium salts and sodium salts. They're all measure, measurable in the actual wines as well. So you tend to get this real sort of salinity, which is backed up by very high acidity due to low pH levels here. And then the sulfur I mentioned, there's often quite distinctive amounts of reduction in these wines, which are kind of ashy, sulfurous, um, smoky, uh, and, you know, in extreme amounts can be very, very intensive. Um, you've got to be able to um, accept reduction, really, to enjoy these wines, certainly when they are young. So the volcanoes that one finds on these islands, four active volcanoes, one on the Canary Ridge, uh, which is the eastern islands of Fuerteventura and Lanzarote, and it's, of course, in Lanzarote, and then three on the Western Islands, which all rise from the ocean floor. And that is on La Palma, El Hierro, and of course, Mount on Tenerife. OK, so three on the left and one on the right. Lanzarote is important to mention because in, in the 18th century, so 1730 to 1736, the volcanic eruptions here left much of the island covered in around three to five meters of lava and volcanic ash, which you see here in this picture. Um, mechanization is extremely uh, rare and you just see this beautiful kind of almost like uh, um, a planet out in the solar system sort of soil. 
But you'll notice here we've got some walls which are built on one side of the vine and some holes where we find the vine itself. So the holes, the oios, uh, these are dug in a conical fashion and the vine sits in the middle of that. So the water then is fed down to the roots because here in Lanzarote, it's around 150 millimetres of rain only per year. And to protect against the wind, walls are actually built. So these are abrigos or cairns or walls that protect it from the prevailing Saharan winds from Africa, which can be exceptionally powerful. OK, so that brings me to a conclusion of this first video on the Canary Islands, a whole 20 minutes just focusing on the introduction, history and geology. Please do join me for the climate. Uh, we'll go through topography and we'll go through some of the most wonderful, outstanding and unique grape growing techniques that you can find in the world. Cordon Transado. Please join me for that video. Once again, any comments or questions, please do get in touch. Comment on this video below. Maybe you've been to one of the islands like Gran Canaria, uh, something like Lanzarote or Tenerife. Maybe you've enjoyed the wines. It'd be lovely to hear your thoughts on the Canary Islands. If you find yourself in the UK as well, please come and say hi for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Ciao for now. Bye bye.